Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. Today's date is March 31st, 2021. And in this video, we're going to be looking at a recent interview that AOC gave to the DSA's Democratic Left magazine, in which she said that criticisms of Joe Biden from the left are, quote, privileged. If you like this video, please click the like button and the subscribe button and consider supporting us on Patreon. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. Okay, so uh, DSA, Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, this is not an organization which I here at Socialism for All endorse because they endorse the Democratic Party, uh, various Democratic Party candidates. They think that that is a strategy that you can use as a socialist to the extent that DSA is truly socialist in the kind of Marxist sense and not social democratic, welfare capitalist, etc. cetera. Uh, I would love it if I could endorse DSA if they were more of an actual socialist organization and didn't engage in class collaborationist nonsense as a just sort of general strategy as they do, uh, thinking that you can work within and take over the Democratic Party. I think that Bernie Sanders had pretty much one shot at taking over the Democratic Party. It was 2016. Uh, you needed to just sort of like storm the gates before they had a chance to get their defenses up. They have been blocking these kinds of attempts for a long time. Uh, he failed to do that. And I think at this point, it should be clear that continued efforts to work within the Democratic Party are wasted time and effort. They're an insult to your intelligence, et cetera. That is my position. So uh, let's get into this article. I'm just going to read the whole interview straight through. Basically, um, it's a little bit dated. The article just came out March 19, 2021 although the conversation is from January 26. So almost two months ago, um, you know, versus the publication date more than two months ago now that I'm doing this video. But, uh, you know, a little closer to the inauguration, etc. cetera. Uh, from what I have skimmed through in this article, it has a very fawning tone. Let's see, and then we will analyze it both as we go and at the end. Here we go. Talking Socialism. Catching Up with AOC, March 19, 2021, by Don McIntosh. Again, this is from dsausa.org. If you click on News and then go to the Democratic Left blog, that's where you'll find this. Bronx Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, best known as AOC, is DSA's foremost socialist superstar. Her June 20... which, just commenting right there, not a great sign... Her June 2018 primary win, a 29-year-old Taqueria bartender defeating the third most powerful Democrat in the U.S. House of Representatives, inspired up to 10,000 people to join DSA. The Netflix documentary Knock Down the House details her life story leading up to that victory. Since then, her influence has only grown. Earnest, fun, relatable, and fierce. She became one of Congress's best-known members overnight and used the attention to pull the national conversation leftward. In October 2019, her endorsement revivified Bernie Sanders' campaign following his heart attack. Today, with over 12 million Twitter followers, because of course that's super fucking important, her picture on the December cover of Vanity Fair, okay, and mass cultural appeal to teens and the not yet political, she continues to use her unasked for celebrity now, I'm sorry, she ran for office, that's very much asked for celebrity, to build support for a democratic socialist agenda. I mean, and I'm not knocking that. The whole point is <laughs> trying to gain both, you know, governmental power and social influence. So anyway, that's just sort of a, a strange phrasing, I think. On January 28, more than a quarter of a million people streamed her impromptu teach-in on the gamer platform Twitch.tv. The topic was the GameStop market rebellion, but... The discussion encompassed a critique of Wall Street and a plug for a wealth tax. AOC spoke with me by Zoom January 26. So we get into the interview now. DSA says, what was your path to joining DSA? AOC, I love this question because I think that my path in DSA very much shaped my organizing strategy. I didn't grow up in an incredibly ideological household. I have friends that grew up the children of unionists, professors, Individuals two or three generations deep into working class movements. That was not my family. I grew up very working class. My mother cleaned houses. My father had a small business. Okay, actually petty bourgeois, but okay. Both my parents grew up in extreme poverty. 
What initially drew me to DSA was the fact that, and by the way, I'm just, I'm not totally knocking the petty bourgeois thing, but anyway, I don't know what kind of small business her father had. What initially drew me to DSA was the fact that they showed up everywhere that I showed up. I started my work as a community organizer before I even knew about the existence of DSA. And I was busy doing work in my community, working with children, working with families, advocating for educational equity. A friend of mine invited me to a DSA meeting in the Bronx, Upper Manhattan branch. We were in the basement of a church uptown in Washington Heights, I believe. It was my first time being exposed to DSA, and to me it was like, okay, we're hearing all this rhetoric and having discussions. And I'm like, okay, another group of folks talking. Like, this is great, this is encouraging. This was around the time when DSA was picketing one of the major camera companies in New York City. Name would be helpful here. Uh, trying to call attention to the warehouse workers. And they brought undocumented warehouse workers to the meeting and translated their testimony. And on top of that, the chapter had free childcare provided to anyone who wanted to show up. And that, to me, at the end of that meeting, I was like, okay, this is real. You know, there's a lot of people who talk about class issues. There's a lot of people who are deep in the discourse of struggle. But to me, as someone who grew up in these environments, it was the translation to action that was distinctive to me. That is what made DSA initially distinctive to me, and it made it something that was flagged to me as worthy of continued attention. And then Jabari Brisport ran for city council. It felt like something fundamentally different to me, even in the context of electoralism. So comment there, it's really not something fundamentally different to me. There have been various progressive groups. I mean, DSA itself has been around for since the 60s, or at least around 1970. Um... That's a long time. So, yeah, you know, various progressive groups have tried to work within the Democratic Party for a long time. I don't know how that's different within the context of electoralism. Uh, Maybe she'll expand. Ironically enough, before I ran for Congress and before Jabari had run for city council in the first race, I myself had huge doubts around electoralism. Okay, well. I think they're justified for reasons that, uh, this is me commenting, I think they're justified for reasons that we'll get into that AOC seems to have turned a massive, uh, you know, put her blind spot on at a minimum. That's why I dove into community organizing, because I was one of those folks that felt we're not going to get any substantive change through electoral politics. It's just not going to happen. I felt that way because I grew up around Bronx machine politics, where there was a lot of cynical use and weaponization of identity under the guise of lobbyist driven policies and corporate policies. I had essentially given up on it, and I felt the only way we're going to do this is by committing ourselves to our communities. So commenting again, she goes on for a while, but like, honestly, I mean, I think AOC's appeal and the Bernie Sanders totally revitalized the Democratic Party, it, they are trying to, like, they know the jig is up and that, you know, people are onto this, that nothing fundamentally changes, and they're trying to sell you on that it will. So, you know, this is her kind of, you know, uh, I like the product so much I bought the company kind of thing here. And I'm not sure that that's um, really anything more than a sales pitch. All right, continuing. Uh, And so it was that first meeting that I felt, okay, this is something that's real. Also in the history of New York City and in communities of color where you have the young lords and you have this organizing heritage There has historically been tension between DSA and these organizing collectives of color, whether it was Latino and Puerto Rican collectives, Chicano collectives, black collectives. It was like, oh, it's these white folks, laughs. There was this historical fissure, but it really felt like a moment when we were coming together. And so when I would see DSA showing up, providing real structural support at BLM rallies or support for abolishing ICE, now an abandoned topic for AOC, where we felt like there wasn't this class essentialism, but that this really was a multiracial class struggle that didn't deprioritize human rights. Frankly, I was really impressed, and I felt like it was something worth being part of. My run for Congress, so much of it was based in coalition building. In the New York City context, I wasn't a DSA candidate that was homegrown from the start. I went through a process of earning the DSA endorsement, and that was in addition to stitching a collective together of the movement for black lives and the movement for immigrant rights. Our congressional district is half immigrant, extraordinarily working class, and just incredibly diverse in the Bronx and Queens. Along with Senator Sanders' campaign, which I also proudly worked on prior to all of this, you know, all of that, I think really contributed to this moment. 
And for me, there's a real distinction between us saying that we're about something and us really being about it in our actions. And it was really that distinction in the action and in the praxis, she really knows all the, the, the right lingo to use, that made it distinctive to me and made it something to be a part of. DSA. What a great story. Thank you for sharing that. DSA's priorities really are your priorities as well, Green New Deal and Medicare for All in particular. There's no getting around the fact that each of those are going to require an act of Congress. What is the most strategic thing that DSA members and chapters could be doing right now to bring that about? AOC. I'm a big believer in exercising a dual approach. First of all, I think you're right. There is no Medicare for all without an act of Congress. The thing is legislation after all. I think sometimes people fall into this trap of wishful thinking about a poll question, thinking that support is solid and that it is unsusceptible to the propaganda of corporate lobbyists and the health insurance industry. I think the first thing we need is real honesty about the work to be done ahead of us. There are some issues that poll really well and the polling is concrete. There are other issues that poll one way or another, and the polling can really fluctuate with just one ad campaign. Actually, we experienced this in a positive way with the Green New Deal, in that the oil and gas lobbies have gone in so hard to try to give the Green New Deal a bad name. And even after the total hammering that it experienced by the Republican Party, it still doesn't poll that poorly. However, one thing that we do see is that even in areas where it may not poll as well as we would like, what we find is that it's highly susceptible to positive messaging. Once we go in and either send organizers or have other forms of messaging and actually explain what the Green New Deal is, polling skyrockets for the issue. And so in terms of tactics and what's needed, I think we need to actually make the case for single-payer health care that is free of cost at the point of service. So commenting, um, actually the case doesn't need to be made anymore. It's already polling at an overwhelming majority, like 70% of the country is in support of it. You uh, and even a majority of Republican voters, uh, you don't need to make the case anymore. You actually just need to go do it. OK, back to the thing. And we have to say what we mean by Medicare for all, because as we know, there are a lot of cynical actors that try to add all these ellipses like Medicare for all who want it that make less than one hundred thousand dollars a year. And that's why we have to engage in the work of organizing. So I would. And OK, commenting again. So. This is right around the force the vote thing like that had, I believe, already happened at this point and uh, in January 2021. So this is really just kind of dodging that. I don't know if DSA is going to bring it up to her. Back to the text. So I would say in terms of our strategic priorities, yes, it's continued organizing. Yes, it's also continued support on the state level for various health care initiatives, such as the single payer proposal in the state of New York. There's a lot of that work that we can do outside of electoralism, but there is critical electoral work to be done as well. I think the strategy of supporting candidates, when that strategy is very calculated, focused, precise, when we aren't casting our net too wide, beyond the capacities of any given local organization, is extremely effective. Mounting continued primary challenges or just supporting candidates in general, putting candidates in open seats, I've seen the impact of it from the inside how much even incumbent members of Congress will totally reinvent themselves in a far more progressive direction because they know that their communities are watching. Uh, comment, do you have an example of that? Because I have a pretty good feeling like things could go on like this for another 20 years and nothing would substantially change. This always happens. It's like there's always one or two progressive people somewhere and, you know, some of the other, you know, more standard corporate, whatever candidates, just regular capitalist candidates, um, they will, you know, put on some lip service for some of these issues, sometimes when cameras are rolling, and nothing fundamentally changes. How do we know that? Because we're living in it. We're living in the future of 20 years ago. We're living in the future of 40 years ago. Nothing really has changed. In fact, things have gotten much, much, much worse. So this is naive at best. I feel like she is modeling naivete to the people listening, trying to convince them of this, again, naive at best worldview. Uh, let's continue. In the best case scenario, we get incredible new members of Congress or we win these open seats. You know, Rashida Tlaib was an open seat. And at worst, we get almost a radical change in the agenda of the incumbent. Give me a fucking break that is presently there, 
And so in many ways, it's a win-win in getting that internal traction that is necessary. DSA. We've heard again and again that from conservative Democrats that an AOC-style agenda might fly in Queens or the Bronx, but it can't win in more competitive districts out in middle America. What's your answer to that? AOC. I think it's totally false. I think that their critique may be more aesthetic, to be honest. God, that was awful. After all, I was born in the Bronx, and I'm bred in this community, and this is my community. So, of course, you know, if I just walk over to another state in Nebraska or whomever, they're just going to suss out real quick that I'm perhaps not a Nebraskan. But I don't... Whoa. Okay. Uh, But I don't think that that is really related to policy. I think it's because I'm a New Yorker, and I act like a New Yorker. And you know what? I need to act like a New Yorker so that I can represent New York's 14th Congressional District. But I don't think that critique really holds water in terms of the actual policies that we are supporting. Sure, in terms of my style of advocacy, it's not going to be the style of advocacy for another local community. But I'm aware of that, and that's not my job. My job is not to represent any other district than mine right now. It also applies the other way. They could not come to New York and to our district and be successful here. So it cuts both ways. And I think it's important that we send the message that our communities are just as necessary and just as critical as any other. But that said, again, this has nothing to do with the actual policy. A lot of times, it's the style of that advocacy. And I think that you can just see the importance of a multiracial and multi-identity, multi-gendered, geographically diverse movement. That's ultimately the strength and beauty of our collective work with Bernie. There are communities that I'm able to speak to and organize. There are communities that Bernie and I are able to speak to and organize. And there are communities that Bernie is able to speak to and organize. And when we come together, we're able to build trust and expand that collective power among all the folks that resonate with each of us individually. The idea like she's not going to win in this one community or another community. I'm not trying to, you know. What we're trying to do is build movement in that community. And that is a very different question than trying to litigate one personality versus another. So commenting, that was really like a lot of words to not say a whole lot. Um, I mean, especially for those of us who don't believe in bourgeois elections, bourgeois government. um, You know, I've been a supporter of the Green Party because it has, I think, the potential to, you know, have have a mass base, doesn't take the corporate money, etc., But even there, running candidates within the bourgeois government, you're going to run into issues. You're going to they're going to try to compromise you by pulling you into um, the way that they do politics, et cetera. There's there's a lot of problems with that. And um, when you look at what AOC is really pushing for, like Medicare for all and the Green New Deal, um, I think, you know, just as we stand here as Marxists on this channel, this is uh, and especially evaluating, you know, how hard they're pushing for them, how effectively they're pushing just for those policies. This is like they're holding these as these lofty goals that maybe we'll achieve in five or 10 years. In five or 10 years, you know, I, I would really like to see massive <laughs> revolutionary change, at least underway, at least in the process. Uh, Green New Deal or Medicare for all are not at all those things. Um, and, and that's how kind of limited her vision is. So I just like to recast this as, you know, more of this bullshit tinkering around the edges that they usually do. All right. You know, none of it gets to property relations. None of it really gets to ending capitalism, which that is our task. We need to do that. All right. Back to DSA. Some on the left. Oh, here it is. Have looked at Biden's record and his differences. That's one way to put it. Differences with the Bernie wing of the party. And they conclude that no progress is going to come out of the Biden administration. What's your view? Buckle up. AOC says, well, I think it's a really privileged critique. Oh, fuck off. We're going to have to focus on solidarity with one another. With who? What are you talking about? Developing our senses for good faith critique and bad faith critique. Go fuck yourself. Go fuck yourself. I don't really have anything else to add. Because bad faith critique can destroy everything that we have built so swiftly. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Fucking everything any progressive has ever done. In the, and that, I'm everybody from social democrats to fucking, like, you know, revolutionary anarchists. Everybody on the, the left. The broad, broad left. Anything we do is gaslit. And that's exactly what she's doing. 
We they gaslight us. They try to misconstrue it, cast it as bad faith. That's exactly what she's fucking. All right. Let me start this paragraph over. Well, I think it's a really privileged critique. We're going to have to focus on solidarity with one another. Question mark there. Developing our senses for good faith critique and bad faith critique. Because bad faith critique can destroy everything that we have, we have built so swiftly. And we, I, I'm just like, blah, 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 what? And we know this because it has in the past. What are you talking about? And it's taken us so many decades to get to this point. I can't not read this in like fake crying voice. It's That's just how it wants to come out. Oh boy. We don't have the time or the luxury <laughs> to entertain bad faith actors in our movement. But also, we have to value our solidarity with one another. For anyone who brings that up, we really have to ask ourselves, what is the message you're sending to your black and brown and undocumented members of your community, to your friends, when you say nothing has changed? Perhaps not enough has changed. And this is not a semantic argument. Just the other night, we in collective struggle were able to stop the deportations of critical members of our community. And that would not have happened in a Trump administration. Guess what? Biden's stepping up deportations to places like Haiti. So fuck you. Fuck you. Sit on this and rotate. Holy fuck. Go fuck yourself. Wow. And uh, I'm going to diverge here a little bit from DSA, who responds to that by saying, thank you. Okay, wow. AOC continues. They were just on the belt, ready to go. And you just cannot say that nothing will change. You didn't change the fucking system. Do you see that? That's, that's the problem. If we want to keep, you know, bailing water <laughs> out of the damaged sinking ship, that's not a fucking win. You need to fix the hole in the side. That's what you got elected for. Not this. So which is it? You're we in collective struggle stopping these deportations or like electing people to the Democratic Party to change things. She's just standing there defending the system and defending the status quo while shitting on your head. You on the left, you socialist. That's what she's doing here. Holy fuck. This is so bad. AOC has been getting worse every fucking time that she goes out. You know, I made a video back in uh, November, it was just a few months ago, where she gave an interview to the New York Times and said like, wow, it's so frustrating. Nothing gets done in the Democratic Party, blah, 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 blah. And I was like, hey, this has some promise. Yeah. Okay. Well, that went out the window for sure with force the vote when she refused to stand up for Medicare for all. And, you know, so... This just gets worse and worse and worse. Keep in mind, folks, she is making $175,000 a year as a Congress entity. So keep that in mind. It sure beats the Taqueria tips. Okay, so AOC, they were just on the belt ready to go. And you just cannot say that nothing will change. We can make the argument that not enough is changing fast enough. And these really are not nitpicking questions of semantics. Because this is how the language that we use communicates to individuals. Let me back that up. And these really are not nitpicking questions of semantics. Because this is how the language that we use communicates to individuals who is included and who do you consider a person. No, no, no. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. This is fucking harm reduction and again, it's still gaslighting because they just elected a guy who's doing more deportations than fucking Trump. So fuck you. This is complete misdirection. And again, she's hiding behind the most exploited people in the society to prop up the status quo. Fuck you. Fuck you. Your party stands in the way of change. Your, st your party stands in the way of us. You're standing in the way of us. Fuck you. We're building a bulldozer, and we are coming for this whole fucking system. Fuck you. Okay, continuing. 
When you say nothing has changed, you are calling the people who are now protected from deportation no one. And we cannot allow for that in our movement. Well, good thing I'm not in your fucking movement. That's not a movement that I want to be part of. Yeah, clearly. And I know that that's not the movement that we are a part of. We're so susceptible to cynicism. And that cynicism, that weaponization of cynicism, is what has and what continues to threaten to tear down everything that we have spent so much time building up. We're allowed to win too, by the way. Yeah, it's not a fucking win. Fuck you. This is like moving the goalposts so badly. I mean, she's just, it, this is if you can't beat them, join them. That's what she's doing here. Okay, on the weaponization of cynicism, I'll give you that. I don't think she's using it correctly, but I'll give you that. Yes, there are supposed progressives who are like, let's court the right wing because Democrats suck. Yeah, that's not the correct response. That is weaponizing cynicism. That is succumbing to cynicism, okay? But this is garbage. I mean, this is a right wing view that she is <laughs> espousing here, dressed up as a left wing view. They're like, well, these people are fake, so let's just go with the people who don't even try to dress it up. Well, that's, again, not a solution. The solution is Marxism. The solution is socialism. The solution is revolution. And that's not what she's talking about here at all. DSA comes back with, I prefer winning, actually. Millions of people are excited about you being in Congress and rooting for your success, but at the same time, no other figure has been targeted by the Fox News crowd quite like you have. Why do you think that they worked to make you such a boogeyman for the right wing? And what's it like to be on the receiving end of that? AOC, I think they've done it because they know that we're a threat. Particularly, you're the new Nancy Pelosi is what you are. Particularly because of the fact that I'm a movement candidate. If I was just some kind of one-off singular candidate, I don't believe that we would be attracting the energy and attacks that we attract. So much of this organized power and organized capital has frankly correctly identified that my candidacy is not an individual venture, but that it is representative of an actual working class movement. Yeah, that you are co-opting. There is a rush to define me to the country before I have the opportunity to define myself. And if you can get enough people to just tune me out or tune out any other person before they can even get the opportunity to hear what one has to say, you're able to go a long way in preserving the current power structure. However, I don't think that strategy lasts the test of time. I think it was a very short-term strategy. I mean, it continues to be a strategy, but I honestly believe that what was just attempted was we're going to throw the book at any candidate like this, we're going to make an example out of her for everyone else, and then we're just going to tar and feather her in the press, and then we're going to mount a $3 million Democratic primary challenge against her that's bankrolled by Wall Street, that was also a Latina, down to having a hyphenated last name. Editor's note, AOC was challenged in the 2020 Democratic primary by Michelle Caruso Cabrera. Back to AOC. And it was just the most cynical, disgusting thing. But it was also trying to convince Democrats that this is too dangerous and that this is a liability. They did that in hopes that it would succeed. And it not only was not successful, but we crushed them, just completely crushed them. DSA. It was very exciting to see that result. So commenting, AOC is about to comment on that. Let me just um, call your attention for a moment to something missing from this. They asked her about some on the left looking at Biden's record, his differences with the Bernie wing of the party, and concluding that no progress is going to come. She gave this little song and dance about they prevented a few deportations and fucking moved on. That was it. That was it. She has nothing else to point to. Nothing else. Nothing. Let me say it one more time. Goose egg. Nothing. Zero. Zilch. Nil. Nothing. She's got nothing. She's got nothing to point to. There is no evidence that this is going to work. There is no evidence that this is going to result in change. This is about... It's just winning a political dogfight within a system where... There's no actual change that's going to come out of it. You just won your seat and you won an argument and you won a debate, but you're not going to do anything different. You're just, you won an election based on what you're standing for, what you're claiming to represent, but are you doing it? Are we getting the change we need? It's not about, you know, oh, we showed the, the press were wrong, blah, blah, blah. It's not about any of that. Who cares about that? 
We need to end capitalism. That's what we care about. And these aren't even steps along the way to doing that. At the very best, these sort of uh, social welfare reforms that DSA is trying to do is going to, you know, well, achieve harm reduction, basically, like make things a little more comfortable within capitalism. It's not going to end capitalism, and it's not going to disarm capital of the power that they will inevitably use to come after us again and take us down again. This is what happened. You know, we got the New Deal in the 30s. The labor movement was strong. You had the coal wars, the actual shooting wars in the 1920s. Um, you know, you get the New Deal and all these reforms. And they last like three decades because by the 60s, uh, you know, they were already planning neoliberalism and the, the neoliberal project in the capitalist class, which was a huge social counter-revolution to usher in, you know, Reagan, the moral majority, all this shit. And it, you know, they did. And that's been the legacy of social democracy. This is what she's selling, and she's not even following through on, like, implementing it. So, anyway, uh, let's go on with the um, interview here. So, DSA said it was very exciting to see that result. AOC said it is exciting because they weaponized all the cynical powers of trying to get someone of my ethnicity, trying to even confuse people in terms of the name, Caruso Cabrera versus Ocasio-Cortez. And her campaign had, you know, $3 million. She was a CNBC anchor, so she had TV and camera training and all of it. And the fact that it was so desperately unsuccessful, I think really speaks to the strength of this movement, that there is a glimmer of hope that it will not be distracted by all of the kind of tricks up the corporate establishment sleeve. And then beyond that, we went to a general election, which had $10 million behind it, backed by a Republican who then tried to do this whole, I might be getting my, my music references mixed up, but trying to do like this whole John Mellencamp vibe, trying to convince people that he's not actually Republican, that he's just a working class dude. So it really shows what their strategy was, which is we're going to throw the book at her and we're going to try to wound her so badly that she doesn't win re-election, and this just becomes a flash-in-the-pan thing. I mean, in the general election, it was the second most expensive congressional race in America. DSA, I did not realize that. AOC, yeah, in the United States, it was the second most expensive race in the country, and so their strategy was to make quick work of us. And they threw everything that they could, and it didn't work. And now I think that they have a problem on their hands. Laughs. Commenting. What is that problem exactly? That there's like three Congress people who say that they don't agree with the mainstream, mainstream Democratic Party? Newsflash, you're like literally 1% of Congress right now. This is not the time to like laugh. And no, they don't have a problem on their hands because what are you actually even fucking doing? Nothing. Nothing. This makes me so frustrated. All right. DSA, yeah, because you got reelected. In fact, you absolutely crushed DSA, uh, AOC, excuse me. And not only that, but we also expanded our presence with the election of Jamal Bowman and Cori Bush. It's really showing that this is not going away. DSA, you're one of 435 representatives in the House, four of whom are open socialists now. Comment, no. No, they're not. Pessimists might look at that and find that daunting. No, not daunting, futile. But you put on a recent Twitter video in which you listed all the specific things you personally got done in two years. You tried to do this in two minutes. It took you four, talking as fast as you could. So, so for our readers, what are some of the most impactful items on that list? AOC. Well, for me, I'm already thinking about this term so far, things that aren't in the video, but have already been early wins. And by the way, this just speaks to talking about how nothing will change. We've already had really two very significant wins. One non-electoral, which was the Hunts Point produce workers being able to support them in securing wage increases and protecting their health care in, in their strike efforts. Editor's note, at the nation's largest wholesale produce market located in the Bronx, Teamsters struck for the first time in 35 years. AOC skipped the presidential inauguration to join them on the picket line. After a week on strike, they won a $1.85 an hour raise. Back to AOC. The reason I bring this up is because I do not believe that they would have had the structural and community support that they were able to generate if we hadn't been building momentum on both electoral wins 
and non-electoral wins. You know, if Joe Biden didn't win the presidency, that would have been a harder strike. Comment. Democrats have been talking about passing fucking card check for like decades and they won't fucking do it. What is card check? It's a, I won't go into the details, but basically it's something that would massively simplify union elections and make it much, much, much easier to form a workplace union uh, by basically eliminating the long delay that currently is in the process, which employers use to terrorize and illegally fire union activists. They won't do it. They don't even talk about it anymore. I'm sorry, this is disgraceful trying to sell people this bullshit. And let me say, yes, I am on YouTube. I am not playing up my reaction. This is my genuine, sincere reaction, is fuck you. This is gaslighting. This is misdirection. This is manipulation. And this is your Democratic Party, including the so-called progressive wing. They're not progressive. They're certainly not socialists. They are a new face for the empire. They will lie to you. They will lead you around by the nose. They will let time go by. Nothing will change. Capitalism will go on. Globalization will go on. Empire will go on. Suffering and exploitation will go on. Nothing will change. This is not what we need. You know... I have a playlist on the channel where I react to different social democratic channels once in a while. You know, it's interesting to check in with current events and, uh, you know, it's good for views. Okay. So I do it once in a while, but, um, these people are so fucking obsessed with like electoral politics. It's so superficial and, um, they don't know anything deeper than what's just going on in the last few years. And they accept this framing. It's just... <laughs> All right. Moving on. AOC, the reason I bring this up is because I do not believe that they would have had the structural and community support that they were able to generate if we hadn't been building momentum on both electoral wins and non-electoral wins. You know, if Joe Biden didn't win the presidency, that would have been a harder strike. Even though they don't seem connected, there is something to be said about the morale of seeing your actions manifest into change, comment, literally, I read in my mind change as cringe, which I think is more appropriate as far as actions manifesting into a Joe Biden presidency, let alone Kamala. Uh, I don't know if as many, and also, by the way, where's the fucking scathing critique of like Kamala's involvement in the housing crisis and housing robbery that took place in California, for example. Where is it? It's nowhere. It's nowhere. And it's never coming. AOC is here to sell you on, look, we got a slightly plumper crumb. Wow. And, and, <laughs> I stole a, another little crumb while Biden wasn't looking. Yeah, that's not, that's not the change we need. So, if you want to sink your time, energy, money, resources, attention into this, you're going to get led around by the nose, period. I'm not saying every Marxist org is doing super great. We're also small, but at least we're pointed in the right direction. You know, fuck winning if you have redefined winning as maintaining the fucking status quo. Seriously. Okay. AOC, I don't know if as many elected officials would have shown up if they didn't feel like more people weren't paying attention. And so to have that institutional support for their demands really allowed the community to rally around, along with the on-the-ground support that DSA provided. You know, I thought one of the things that was so inspiring in talking to many of these unionists was that they expressed to me shock every night I was there that so many young people showed up to the picket line. Comment, yes, there's a horrible generational divide in, you know, who is involved in unions. Union membership has declined greatly. This is partly uh, problems with labor laws. It's also problems with how the business unions run their shit. They've been concessionists since the 80s, 
And I know that there are some unions that are more fighting unions, but there's a widespread fucking problem. And they keep supporting fucking Democrats. I'm not saying that supporting Republicans, let alone libertarians, is a better option. But at some point, you've got to pull the fucking plug. You've got to walk away. You've got to say, but again, they're there to sell you out, just like AOC. They're not independent. We need an independent left now. Independent of capital, independent of corporate money, independent of capitalist political parties. Period. Okay. AOC, they had no idea what was going on, but they were thrilled, and they knew that it was adding so much power to their strike efforts. And it really kind of goes both ways, too. It elevated the consciousness of even the unionists of the fact that they weren't alone and that their struggle was part of a larger collective one, really made the strike stronger. And the other win was being able to secure $2 billion for FEMA reimbursements for funeral expenses. And again, is that good? Yes, I'd rather have the money than not have the money, but you haven't changed the system. Okay, DSA. For those who died of COVID. AOC. Yeah, for individuals who have died of COVID. And there's a couple of reasons why this was so important. Gee, I can't wait to hear about them. First of all, this was a homegrown effort. New York 14 was the most heavily impacted congressional district at the outbreak of the pandemic. And Elmcor and our constituents in East Elmhurst, which is kind of in the shadow of Elmhurst Hospital, the most heavily hit hospital in the country at one point, They reached out immediately, and they said this is a disease that is disproportionately impacting people along lines of race and class, and it is disproportionately impacting the black, the brown, and the low income, and as a consequence, the subsequent deaths, particularly at the beginning, were concentrated among black patients, brown patients, and low income patients. So you take that a step further, and the expenses for a funeral can go $5,000 to $10,000. That's a life-altering expense for a working class family when the average American has 400 bucks in savings, especially in the middle of a pandemic, when this is not something that is planned or expected at all. That's the kind of death that is earth-shattering that can put a family under for a decade plus, if not more. I experienced this myself when my family lost my dad and we saw how expensive it was, and it took a decade to get out from that debt. So when you target this for reimbursement, it's actually quite a progressive cash transfer because when you're reimbursing those who have died of COVID, And COVID is disproportionately... Okay, I'm sorry. I just can't listen to this breakdown. You know what would be even better? if We just got fucking money every month. Did you ever think of that? But again, misdirecting you onto these crumbs so that you don't engage in the, quote, privileged critique of all the fucking things they're obviously not doing. We're getting near the end, thank God, of this uh, interview. But really, this is trash. This is trash. If you want to spend all your time working on these crumbs without a larger, without really like a larger revolutionary political message, fucking go for it. I would rather slam my head in a car door. Not, not appealing. All right, where were we? I just... She's in the party. All they're doing is rebuilding the left liberal wing of an anti-socialist party. That's all they're doing. All right. Back to AOC. Because when you were reimbursing those who have died of COVID and COVID is disproportionately impacting the black and the brown and the working class, you're able to lift those families or at least patch them through to prevent inequity and inequality from further bottoming out the bottom. And that's the reason we prioritized it so much. The fact that we were able to actually pass it on to the Trump administration is pretty remarkable. Okay, so you can get some things done in a Republican administration. It's not like totally... Anyway, we were able to get $2 billion authorized under Trump. Now that FEMA is operating under Biden, we can now work with the administration to administer these funds and dole them out in a way that is not going to be as stonewalled or corrupt as it would be under the Trump administration. Ringing endorsement right there. DSA, one of the exciting things about your early days in Congress was your willingness to break from convention. Like when you blew the lid on the freshman orientation a long fucking time ago, 
that was crawling with corporate lobbyists or appeared at the Sunrise Movement sit-in in Pelosi's office. Yeah, because that worked out well long term. Has your strategy shifted at all from those days? Obviously it has. Okay. AOC, I don't think so. Of course you don't. Or you don't want us to. I do think that the pandemic has complicated those things a little bit because a lot of stuff really does happen behind closed doors. Okay, what? And it's funny, but, you know, people will say and do things at a cocktail party that they will not do in a Zoom call. So I would say that the opportunities for disruption have varied a little bit in this digital situation that we're in, but I still think that they exist. One thing I do think has changed is that I do believe we're getting more sophisticated. I think about all of our tactics as different tools in a toolbox. Wow, good metaphor. And when I first started, I had a hammer. And when you have a hammer, everything's a nail, as they say. But then as you learn about other methods, you can get a wrench and then you get a screwdriver. Then you're able to add a lot more to your tools. You add the tools of electoralism, supporting other members to join. You have the tools of sunlight. There's this one moment I'll never forget. We were going through the appropriations process, I believe in 2019 or so. And basically, this is how we fund the entire government. We go along and we fund each agency after the other. And there are these massive multi-thousand page packages. And I remember finding, sometimes it's as simple as hitting control F and just trying to find every policy related keyword to see what's getting appropriated and see what you can dig through. That's literally how some folks go about this when you're given a thousand pages of legislation 48 hours before it drops. Okay, comment. That's not a functioning system. That's what they did with the Patriot Act. There was a big spotlight put on that. It's like this thing that's like the size of three dictionaries and they're expected you know, to pass it the next day. That's not a functioning government. This is a corporatocracy. This, is, this isn't even capitalist democracy. It is policy written by a handful of people working for the biggest banks, etc. It's not even democracy among capitalists. This is just, it's, it's like capitalist autocracy, basically. We're, you know, we've been in the stage of monopoly capitalism for quite a long time, like a century plus. And, um, you know, you know, let's realize the golden days of social democracy are long, long gone. And now we're in a system where a bunch of corporate tools just rubber stamp whatever they're told to rubber stamp and vote against anything that they're told to vote against. And um, there's no honor to the system. There's no, forget glamour. There's no prestige. Um, It's a disgusting, disgusting. There's nothing you can do with it. It's just, it's hopeless. Throw it away. Um, We've known this for a long time. That's literally how some folks go about this when you're given a thousand pages of legislation 48 hours before it drops. But we found this really bizarre appropriation for fossil fuel facilities, and it was like a multi-billion dollar giveaway, I believe, at the time. We were like, where did this come from? Did someone slip this in? And we were going to propose an amendment to take it out. So we raised the question about this, and because no one wanted to fess up and actually own that they were the one who put that in, it was withdrawn without actually making it a floor fight. Yeah, I don't think we ever got to the bottom of who was behind that. Clearly, you know, this is lobbyist driven. This was a lobbyist's language that someone asked to put in. But because the actual line item was so shameful, no one wanted to actually fess up to the fact that they had put it in. There are so many of these wins, but they aren't necessarily public fights every time. They are wins to the tunes of millions and billions of dollars that could then be shifted to other priorities. Okay, so they literally just print money. Uh, You don't even have to take it out to, like, shift it to other things. Anyway, more gaslighting. Some of that, and it's it's gaslighting to just, again, defend her existence. Like, what she's doing there, she's trying to sell you on, like, the necessity of what she's doing. Clearly, I'm not buying it. I hope you're not either. We're getting really near the end. Some of that work is quiet, but it is just as significant as some of the public fighting and organizing. Not to disparage that either, but they complement one another. DSA, you're famous for skillfully clapping back at haters from time to time, but you don't come off as mean, and you never punch down. How do you stay so positive? (laughs) AOC, oh, thank you. Well, you know, positivity is an organizing tool, and I say that with so much earnestness there's a reason why Jabari Brisport won. There's a reason why Zoran Mamdani 
Sorry, I'm reading this on like really small letters. I just couldn't really read that. Uh, there's a reason why Marcella Mitenas and Farah Soufrant Forrest, these wins that we had on the state level, why those candidates won, look at them. They're relentlessly positive. They're people that you want to be around. And they're not cynical, and they do not engage in more socialist than thou. Yeah, probably because they're not even a little bit socialist. That would be my guess. And, you know, I don't like more socialist than thou either. There's a certain line. We're, we're about Marxist unity on this channel. There's a certain line. I do think we need to stop some of the definitely more pointless infighting. But give me a fucking break. What you're doing is not socialism at all. They're just relentlessly positive. And I think that the most important thing that we can do in order to win, again, it's all about just this winning, winning. Winning seats in bourgeois government here and there, winning a crumb here and there, it, it's not what we're looking for. That we can do in order to win is to be people and spaces that people want to be around. And that is our organizing priority. Comment. So I agree with that. I just think we should do it for socialism, not whatever the fuck you're doing. We have to make Medicare for All something that everyone wants to be a part of. Newsflash, they already do. You were resisting introducing the legislation. We have to make Green New Deal. Winning seats in bourgeois government here and there, winning a crumb here and there, it, it's not what we're looking for. That we can do in order to win is to be people and spaces that people want to be around. And that is our organizing priority. Comment. So I agree with that. I just think we should do it for socialism, not whatever the fuck you're doing. We have to make Medicare for all something that everyone wants to be a part of. Newsflash, they already do. You were resisting introducing the legislation. We have to make Green New Deal something that everyone wants to be a part of. I think people sometimes are dismissive of this in thinking that it's less serious than study. But who's going to join your book club if it sucks? Fuck you. Fuck you. You suck. You suck. And we are going to steamroll you. Fuck you, AOC. Fuck you. Who's going to join your reading group if they feel judged? Ah, the amount of just smarmy arrogance that she is modeling. I can't stand it. It's like nails on chalkboard. So the most important thing we need to do is to really create something, excuse my language, but that's fucking fun. Well, I'm going to end here. I don't have much else to say. Um, what do you think? Leave a comment. You know, a lot of people are having fun ripping on social Democrats and we are organizing as socialists. And yes, there is some stuff going on that I think is needlessly hateful in the socialist world. Okay? It is. And I think that some of that stuff takes the place of more constructive outreach efforts. And I do think that there is some stuff that's very online and won't translate at all to the real world. But what AOC is doing here is just gloating. We're winning. We're winning. Again, take the Democratic Party, find a giant toilet, flush it. Flush it. It's crap. I really don't enjoy doing these videos. I consider this really just bad news for socialists. I like doing more feel-good stuff. I don't think this is inspiring. I don't think this is a win. I think that this is a win for the status quo. And with that, have a good rest of your day. And that's the video. Thanks to our current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen or just support us financially, you can go to patreon.com slash socialism for all and sign up for a monthly donation. You can also follow us at facebook.com slash socialism, the number for all used to have a page at for all and it got throttled to death by Zuck here on YouTube. Please click the like button, subscribe button and the notifications bell. 
please leave a comment if you can, and please share our video wherever you're online, your Twitter feed, your Discord servers, Reddit subs, etc. All of that helps more people to see this content, whether it's in the YouTube algorithm or just posting it on other sites. All of that's helpful. All of you out there supporting and promoting this content makes it all go that much more smoothly. We need to end capitalism, normalize talking about socialism today, and uh, it's really kind of our only hope for a better tomorrow. Thanks for all you do, and we will catch you in the next video.